topic. Last time we had a look at photosynthesis and in photosynthesis what we did we took carbon dioxide, we took water and in the presence of light we turned that into glucose which is C6H12O6 plus we made as a byproduct oxygen which we didn't really want. So the question is what does the plant do with the glucose? So let's see what actually happens here uh, with the glucose. Now glucose is simply a six carbon sugar and it's got uh, carbon up here and it's got sort of basically OHs up here and H's round there so this sort of uh, I'm not trying to be specific on what I'm doing here and what can we do with this glucose well in fact there are two forms of glucose and the two forms are important just by looking at this bit of piece here in that when we make this we can either make it with the OH one way up or we can make it with the other way up and they're called alpha and beta glucose it doesn't alter really much about the glucose but what it does do it makes a difference when these molecules combine so if we have most of these glucoses joining together they can either form sort of basically little chains so what we do is we get a chain of glucoses that might look something like this and every now and again there are some branches possible on them now if there are branches on them then it is in fact easier to digest now this representation here is basically more like what you have in the human body which would be something like glycogen which is actually made up from all these glucoses but in plants the two main uses of glucose are starch and cellulose both made from the same glucose molecules joined together now glucose has a problem and that is it is osmotically active and what do I mean by that osmotically active means that if I've got my cell and I've got a lot of glucose in here then water from the outside will rush in and the cell will swell now in a plant cell that's a good thing but it can be too much and so what the plant can do is it can take this glucose join them together in very long chains and that makes starch and starch is basically really not very soluble 
and that is a very easy experiment to try and show you because you take some starch and you add some water to it and very little happens it really won't dissolve very well and if you want to try this one at home it's a very easy experiment to try and do you simply take some flour which is basically starch and you try and add a little bit of water to it and get it to dissolve and it doesn't work very well it really is a hard job try to get it to dissolve and even when you do it sort of doesn't dissolve properly really it's sort of because basically we've got these very long large chains and they're really difficult to try to isolate and from one another and try and get the water around it. it doesn't work very well so plants make the starch because they can then store it and it is not osmotically active and this is useful for the plant so it can store this so basically when there's lots of light plants can make lots of starch right now what's the test for starch well we've done this before but I will just mention it again test for starch is using iodine iodine indicator this is basically a brown liquid and what happens is you put this brown liquid on starch and it turns very much a blue almost black color now how can we actually see this in action well there are various experiments and I can't easily set these experiments up to do in the short time that we have because these experiments normally take a little while but what I can do is I can describe the experiment that we would actually do so what we would do is let's take a leaf preferably still attached to a plant so it's actively photosynthesizing and it's got lots of light pouring down on it and what we do is we cover this up with something like a piece of foil and we leave now this in the sunshine for quite a long time we're looking at at least 24 hours now when we come to look at the experiment then what we've got to do is a fairly simple routine the fairly simple routine is simply we're going to try and have a look at that leaf to see what's happened so we then remove the leaf and what I would suggest we do with this is we take some alcohol and basically I want to heat it. Now we have to be very careful whoops, trying to heat the alcohol because it's flammable and it can be great fun so I would normally heat this without a naked flame using something like a hot plate or a heating mantle and we can take this alcohol so it's virtually boiling it can even be boiling we then put our leaf in there and we put that in there for a little while now what the alcohol does is it simply destroys the Q 
cuticle. This is this waxy layer that goes around the leaf. Once we've done this then we simply take this out and we put this into another beaker this time with hot water and that is basically going to try and also soften the plant. The alcohol as well as destroying the cuticle will actually remove a fair bit of the colouring and this is helpful if we're going to try and look at the starch. Once we've done that then we simply take out our leaf and we add iodine to us and our results should be that the leaf goes a very blue black colour like that and this area is where we had the foil and we can see here very simply then that if we've got blue black here because this has got starch and this has got starch but where there was a lack of light no starch was made so we can see from this that light enables the plant to make glucose and from glucose the plant makes starch but of course it's not the only thing that the plant makes the plant will actually make other things as well and one of those is cellulose what's cellulose used for well if we draw out our typical plant cell then we usually describe round this plant cell a cell wall this cell wall is basically like looking at a piece of scaffolding around a building it's not complete molecules can easily move through but it provides enormous strength cellulose properties of it it's very insoluble and as far as many animals are concerned it's quite indigestible and if we have to do that then generally we have to use bacteria to help and this is why if you've got something like a cow the cow as we know eats grass but does it well yeah of course it eats the grass but does it actually digest the grass and the answer is no the cow doesn't you see what the cow does is the cow simply eats the grass there we are and as it eats the grass it goes into here the stomach inside the stomach there are large numbers of bacteria
the cow can regurgitate the grass and put it back and that we know as something like chewing the cud. This is this cut grass and it's the bacteria that are breaking down the cellulose and the cow keeps regurgitating the food until it can tell that the grass is actually turning quite sweet. It's being turned from cellulose to glucose and once it's done that then it knows to move it from the stomach to the rest of the digestive system where it can also eat the bacteria as well. So cellulose a really strong material. We know it's strong because mostly cellulose is used to make things like cotton, maybe flax, hemp. These are different plants and all of these make our clothes. So really is very strong and indigestible and it's a wonderful thing so cellulose here is available here because it is extremely strong fibers and basically that's what keeps a plant held together and why we can use it for clothes and other things but what else? Well, the plant needs to be able to make all sorts of things. And basically, when you eat food, you don't make anything. No, you get all of your raw materials from plants. So the plant has got glucose. Now, with this glucose, it's going to do various things. So we've already got down here some ideas and we said well yes it can make starch and cellulose but what else can it do well if the plant takes on some nitrates from the soil it can add the nitrates to the soil and it can use that to make amino acids these amino acids then can be reassembled here to make proteins. The proteins are going to make all the things that we're going to use. It's going to make things like the enzymes. It's going to make the structural proteins. It's going to make various hormones very useful for these proteins so proteins made from amino acids and that is made from taking nitrates and adding them to the glucose and then processing them and changing them and modifying and making up to sort of 20 different amino acids some plants sometimes don't make all of them and sometimes we're a bit short on some and that can give vegans sometimes some problems and food supplements are necessary what else can we come up with well glucose can also be used to make fats and oils. We would call those the lipids. And this is used, I suppose, largely of storage of food, which tends to be sort of longer term. 
so we've got that and it can be used as a basically as a an energy store here for the food um, some plants are very rich in this and that makes them good for food or perhaps for fuels so glucose here is responsible for being the precursor for making all the carbohydrates all the proteins and all the lipids as well as that then we're going to see also something that's ignored largely are these vitamins vitamins necessary for healthy life and we all know the stories of vitamin C and without that the sailors used to get scurvy and that was solved very easily by giving them some fresh fruit to eat and once they had that problems went away there are lots of vitamins and they are really fairly essential for healthy living and you don't make them they're only made in the plants so you've got to get those vitamins by eating your plants which is why most governments have a thing about eating your five a day or probably now let's call that a seven a day in basically fruit and veg and it's important because this is the only way that you're getting a lot of your vitamins your lipids and your proteins there are of course some plants that have problems and they live in very poor places there's not much nitrogen available and these plants will divide up into perhaps a few categories so let's mention some of these plants we have all come across things like I know Venus flytrap you might have come across the sundew and you might have come across the pitcher plants all of these are basically what is known as the carnivorous plants basically they're getting their nitrogen from simply insects So, the Venus flytrap, famous because it basically just catches the plant, the animal, the plant literally can move that fast, not surprising really. The pitcher plant, a very, very slippery surface and plants fall into the really stinky smelling liquid that attracts them and the sundew which has these little sticky droplets that the insects go and think they're going to try and feed on and in fact cause their demise because they can't escape the stickiness some plants go to other lengths though to try and get nitrogen and these are 
the legumes. Now the legumes, fairly simple, things like, for example, runner beans. What they have on the roots are nodules. And on these root nodules, they attract bacteria. And more than bacteria, these are nitrogen fixing bacteria and the plant offers these bacteria a home and in exchange the bacteria fix nitrogen this is from the air and they make from that NO2, NO3, nitrates and the plants benefit by using that. So there are a whole series of different mechanisms plants can use to try and get their nitrates other than directly from the soil. So Plants and, I suppose, algae use glucose in photosynthesis to convert into starch, fats and into proteins. So, let's look at where do you come in. Well, you come in in that you want something really simple. And the problem is, you want strawberries at Christmas. Now, let's suppose you want some strawberries. Well... Strawberries are available sort of, I would call it a Wimbledon time, sort of June, July. But basically you want these all the year round. So how are you going to do it? Well, we need to try to do something with growing these things. So let's look at simply the garden greenhouse many people have these and what are they so basically they've been around for i don't know a couple of thousand years i suppose really and basically what they can do is they provide shelter and they provide some warmth so the season can start earlier so then you might get your strawberries perhaps in April to perhaps August you're trying to help the system then what's going on well we need to look at perhaps a way of trying to have a commercial greenhouse now a commercial greenhouse doesn't in fact have to be outside it doesn't have to have sort of any light. This could be just a building. Let's say one with no glass. Right, so what they need to do is they need to provide the water. They need to provide a good supply of carbon dioxide. They need to provide 
the warmth and obviously they need to provide light and once you're starting to control all of these things you can control what is the season because the plants now won't know what the season is and so all they do is they grow really as quickly as possible so here we get from this the fastest growth and as far as a farmer would be concerned the highest yield and this then makes this really quite attractive to farmers trying to do this but we are needing to try and do a few things well there are additional ways that we can try and do this uh, sometimes we can grow this without soil and if you can grow this without soil this is what we call hydroponics and hydroponics very simply means that we've got a sort of a downhill slide sitting on here I've got my various little plants growing These are rather frightening for little plants. The water basically flows down and as the water flows down we've also got in here all the minerals it needs especially things like nitrates for making the proteins. There's another group of things called all the phosphates for making things like DNA and we've got other essential minerals and these are often called NPK fertilizers if you go to a garden center you'll often see labels on fertilizers being what sort of thing they are nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. So we've got all sorts of things here that can be used to help plants grow and what we're doing here as well as providing water, carbon dioxide, warmth, light, what we're also doing here is you can simply control pests if there's no soil then there's nowhere for them to live and so we get our plants to grow quite happily now the size of these greenhouses can just be described basically as enormous they are generally all computer controlled the computer can control the amount of water it can control the amount of CO2 releasing CO2 as the levels fall it can provide the optimum amount of warmth and it can provide the optimum amount of light at the right frequencies and 
basically all of this means that basically this is expensive. So if we're trying to have all this computer environment control it's going to cost money. However, there are less staff because we can for a largely automate the systems and there are some wonderful videos out there watching what happens to plants as they're made and as they're harvest and not really much is sort of lost so basically all of this is done basically so you can basically reduce all the limiting factors and if you've reduced those limiting factors then we've got basically lots of plants growing there are just a couple of things about economics and I'll just cover those very quickly so our problem with economics are very simple let's suppose I keep something like uh, a low amount of CO2 and I keep it at 20 degrees C and basically if we measure here light intensity and we measure with this perhaps something like the rate of photosynthesis then it's going to give us a graph that looks like that. If I add more CO2 then keeping the temperature the same we're going to get a greater rate of photosynthesis but we're also looking at going up here the cost increasing and if I then keep high CO2 but keep it warmer the cost goes up but we are producing more plants and you have to sort of weigh up a problem simply of economics and we're basically looking at what is here the most efficient. Is it high CO2? Is it a higher temperature? Or is it the amount of light? We know, regardless, they need lots of water. So, this is very important to a farmer to try and work out what they can do. And one of the big problems about growing in a greenhouse are things like infections because you've got one type of plant 
and so an infection one infection can take out the whole so that's not particularly good so we've got problems with infections and I suppose infestations insects and so these have to be maintained and the way to do this is we need efficient cleaning and so that makes these systems quite good plants grown hydroponically basically all these problems limiting factors that we talk about the amount of carbon dioxide the amount of warmth the amount of light now totally irrelevant and if you want your strawberries on Christmas Day it's not a problem in fact it's not a problem to get any food that's grown any day of the year all it does is it costs I hope you found this useful if you did then please subscribe give us the thumbs up and I will see you next time when we do some more GCSE biology topic by topic until then stay safe bye bye